All right, sorry about the delay. I wanted to get the recording uh, set up. Can you guys hear my mic? Everything is good, right? Um, welcome to CS 3510. I think this is lecture nine uh, on dynamic programming. Uh, this is what I think is either the hardest or the easiest unit in um, 3510. Uh, it's one of those things that either you get it or you don't, and you, you know, an exam tests you. Uh, it doesn't test if you know something. It simply tests if you know something by a certain date. So you need to ensure that you get it as soon as possible. Everyone either makes like an A or a C on the exam, so you need to get it, or you, or you'll. If you don't get it, you won't get it. Simply, it, but once it clicks for you, it becomes incredibly easy. Incredibly easy. Um, DP is also one of those things that you learn at, uh, it's one of those things that differentiates like a good CS degree from a bad CS degree. Because a lot of people graduate from other colleges not knowing anything about this technique. And it's not actually that important in practice, to be honest, but it's in essential for getting interviews. I would put like 60, 40 odds you get a dynamic programming problem on an interview question. So if you don't get DP, then it's, 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 you know, it's sort of doomed for you. Um, that's why it's really important that you try really hard during this unit. Um, and you work really hard. So uh, what is dynamic programming? It's, it's a made up word. It doesn't mean anything. But it refers to a technique invented by somebody uh, in, in the sense that you have, I mean, the closest thing we can do is compare it to uh, divide and conquer. Divide and conquer, if you think about it, you have some uh, problem splits nicely into, the, into, the, into a tree like this, right? That's great. You know, and then you can divide the problem into subproblems recursively, where the function calls itself until it subdivides into some smallest base case, and then it simply recombines all the way up. And that's what the div conquer technique is. But you can think of divide and conquer, excuse me, you can think of dynamic programming as a technique uh, that is uglier in the sense that you don't know exactly, the recursion tree is not nice and perfect looking. But if there is still, quote unquote, a recursion tree. It's just a lot worse looking. Maybe it looks like this. Right? So it's, there's not an immediately nice structure that you can say, oh, every subproblem has exactly three subproblems, and all of those three subproblems have three subproblems, and so on. Dynamic programming can be thought of a recursive, as a recursive problem. It's still defined recursively, it's just much worse in the recursion tree. So instead of going top down and a problem will call itself recursively on its subproblems, divide and conquer, instead you go bottom up so to speak. There's a top-down DP and bottom-up DP. We're really only going to focus on bottom-up DP, which is that you, 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 you do the smallest problems iteratively first, and then you recombine them correctly to get the final answer out. So instead of starting top-down and recursively calling it on smaller subproblems, you compute all the smaller subproblems one at a time, build them, building it up correctly to the largest problem, and then that's what you want to return. Um, You've done a DP algorithm already, and you hey, may not have realized it. Uh, some of those graph algorithms were DP. Uh, Floyd Warshall was DP. Bellman Ford is technically a DP algorithm. Uh, but it, importantly was the Fibonacci one that we did, right? Uh, this was the recursive way of doing uh, Fibonacci. And we mentioned earlier this had a really, really bad runtime. Uh, and it repeated a lot of information. But Fibonacci, you can think of uh, in its recursion tree, it does call on its smaller subproblems. But it's not necessary to implement Fibonacci recursively when you could simply, instead of repeatedly computing something, simply write down that subproblem. Uh, store it and then recall it for later. So we gave an, uh, a better algorithm of this as def.
So you may recall this is the way that you do the Fibonacci numbers with pen and paper. Also, if there's any mistakes, let me know. Um, what you do, and this is really the framework that every single dynamic programming problem is going to have. There's going to be some decision made on your base cases. What are the smallest things you do? There's going to, before that, there's going to be even a decision on the memory structure. Here, we, we, it's in pseudocode, I'm simply saying allocate an array of size n plus 1 of all zeros. Uh, when you allocate something in pseudocode, you need to be it should be clear what the time complexity of doing that is. So you usually want to just say, you know, I'm allocating n plus 1 elements um, of all zeros, and the time complexity of that is going to take O of n. Right? It should be obvious. When you write pseudocode, it should be obvious what the runtime is. Uh, if you were to say allocate with this certain starting value of some function, it's not obvious what the runtime of that is because it takes time to compute whatever, whatever that function is. Uh, you fill in your base cases. Here it's dp of 0 is 0, dp of 1 is 1. And then you decide on your recurrence. And the recurrence is thought of similarly to a, div a divide and conquer recurrence. Here uh, we return fib of n minus 1 plus fib of n minus 2. But here we're setting dp of i to dp of i minus 1 plus dp of i minus 2. So the recurrence still feels recursive, but it's not a recursive call. It's simply a dependency of a future memory space upon a function of the previous memory spaces. Right? The subproblem dp of i contains the ith Fibonacci number, but it is equal to the sum of the previous two. Right? Like that, and so on, in the future and in the past. Then you're going to decide what is the last thing I'm going to return, and the last thing you're going to return will be the last element, right? It's, not, it's usually true, but not always true, that the last thing that you return will be simply the nth element of the array or whatever, right? Here, the Fibonacci numbers start indexing at 0, and the nth Fibonacci number is technically the n plus, n plus 1th number. So the array is n plus 1, where you return the nth element of it, right? Any questions on this? Yeah? Ah, because we've already filled in the array. We iterate over the array and f compute every single subproblem. Only because we care about computing the nth Fibonacci number. But the nth Fibonacci number is dependent on the n minus 1th and n minus 2 Fibonacci number, and which is dependent on the n minus 3 Fibonacci number, and so on. You do all the smaller subproblems, combining them correctly to get the only answer that you care about. But in the process, you'll end up computing the answer for all the problems, usually. All the smaller subproblems, usually. Uh, this can be thought of as uh, a time-space trade-off. But it's never, a DP is never really a trade-off, right? So uh, here, the, this algorithm compared to the one on the top uses, is, is more efficient, certainly, but it does use more space, right? You have to write down all the previous answers, and this one you don't. You simply recompute the answer every time you need it. So you trade off some space for a huge saving in time. But it's never actually truly a trade off. This is a constant space one, and this is a non-constant space one. But I claim that you could modify this and improve this to be constant space if you wanted to. We won't ever do this in practice, but I just want you to understand that it's not truly a trade off. Why? All you have to do is, if you notice, you don't need the n elements. To compute the ith element, you only need the previous two. So instead of allocating n elements, simply allocate three elements and then start swapping things around, right? The ith one, the third one, takes on the sum of the two, and then you simply swap the labels around, right? Do you agree that you could implement this with three variables instead of an n plus one sized array? It just makes the code messier, and we won't ever do it. But know that if you had to, you could get the space back. You, you trade some of the time for space, but then you can, get the, you can always get the space back. And today is simply we're going to do like several DP problems, several classic problems, uh, just to get you warmed up to it. Any questions so far? Okay. Um. Uh, this first problem is called stair stepping. It's a, you know, uh, some of the basics. You have a n steps, and you can jump 
one, two, or three steps. Uh, how many different ways? Uh, can uh, you get to uh, step n? So you're at some step, right? It's a terrible staircase, but you're at some step, and then you can jump one step, you can jump two steps, or you can jump three steps. At any moment, you can decide to jump one step, or you can decide to jump two steps, or you can decide to jump three steps. Um, how many ways can you get to step n? Uh, so. There's another skill that you need to be able to develop in is that when you look at a problem, how do you know when to apply DP? During this unit, everything's going to be a DP problem, so you won't have to, the opportunity to develop that skill because you have to apply DP to every single problem. But out there in the wild, in uh, you know, an interview or something, you may have to d think, oh, this is a DP problem. Uh, that's sort of a skill that's hard to describe to develop, but the way I, I could suggest it is like DP applies only in scenarios where you can't really think of anything else. Right? The only other algorithm you might be able to think of if you don't know DP might be brute force. And that's really bad. You usually don't want to brute force something. So if you can't think of anything, it's probably going to be DP. Another indication that the problem is DP if it can be defined recursively. Somehow the nth subproblem can be defined in terms of smaller subproblems, right? So how many ways can you get to step n? So first off, what's, what's our memory structure? Later on, we'll see two-dimensional, th even three-dimensional arrays. Uh, but here, for um, I think most of the things problems today are going to be one-dimensional. There'll be a few two-dimensional arrays. So first, you want to decide, does my problem feel like it needs to move around freely in two dimensions, or is one dimension fine? So we're going to define uh, dp of 1 to n. Uh, you're going to allocate uh, n elements. And then you want to assign to meaning an element of the dp table. So you're going to say dp of i is equal to the num ways to reach a step i. Now, this is a, kind of an important step, and it, it, it's sort of subtle. Uh, variables don't really mean things, they're just numbers. But if you assign to it a meaning, then it's really important for your recurrence. Because when you define the recurrence, you'll be able to uh, say, oh, well, it's this subproblem. So instead of uh, declaring the subproblem, literally, I'm just going to call on the stored value. Right? So dp of 1 is going to be uh, 1. Uh, dp of 2 is going to be what? Two, you can either jump two steps, or you can jump one step, one step. So that's two. Uh, what about dp of three? You can jump one step, one step, one step. You can jump one step, two steps, or two steps, one step. And then you can jump three steps. So what is that, four? That's four. Right? OK, now what's our recurrence? The number of ways to reach step i, you think what you, another way you can do dp is you can rewind time by one step. Think about all the set of possibilities you can or can't do. Right? What is the last thing you could do? You take a step. is the very last thing you do. And the last thing you do, being a step, you have, the op you have three choices of what the step could be. It could be a step of size 1, it could be a step of size 2, or it could be a step of size 3. All of those possibilities can lead you to the ith step. So if you're at some ith step, you could come from the previous step, you could come from two steps away, or you could come from three steps away, right? So it turns out that we'll, dp of i will be equal to dp of i minus 1 plus dp of i minus 2 plus dp of i minus 3. Why? Well, dp of i minus 1 is the number of ways to reach the i minus 1 step. And the number of ways to reach the ith step is, has to be greater than the number of ways to reach the i minus 1 step. Because this accounts for all the ways you could reach the i minus 1 step and then perform one jump. Right? This i minus 2 is all the ways you could reach up to two steps before, and then you jump twice. You jump, excuse me, you jump two steps. 
And this accounts for all the ways that you reach three steps away and you make a, a leap of size three, right? This is common in when you write a DP recurrence. You're going to have everything that is or isn't. You'll have every single possibility. And then you'll apply all these possibilities as a function uh, to your answer. If it's the number of ways you're doing something, it's probably going to sum the subproblems. If it's a max or a min problem, you're probably going to take the max or the min of the subproblems. If you have uh, you know, something complicated, maybe you'll have some other complicated function. But you have to consider all possibilities, and then simply at, those are going to be the variables, uh, so to speak, of your recurrence. Right? Any questions on the recurrence? Yeah? Uh, how many ways can you jump to step three? You can go uh, one plus two. Then you can go one plus one, oops, one plus one plus one, right? You can go two plus one, and you can just do three. So those are the four distinct ways to get reach the third step. Yes? Is this similar to like classifying integers or partitions? Kind of. Uh, yeah, and the, and the integer partitions, but notice that this is not, this is, uh, the problem has restricted ourselves to only jumping one, two, or three steps. Uh, how would you do this if you were allowed to jump any number of steps? You could define such a DP recurrence probably for integer partition as well. Yeah, but it, it, the thing to note is that integer partition like this, a partition can be defined recursively as a smaller sum through the smaller table, right? Any more questions on this? Now, how would I, another thing to note is that these are not actually the smallest base cases. You can actually compute uh, DP of three had I allocated DP of zero. If I allocated a DP of zero, you could have computed a DP of, of zero. Uh, you could compute DP of three had I started the table at DP of zero, right? Well, suppose I did. How many ways can you get to the zero step? This is a, sort of a trick question, but you need, to you need to be able to understand in order to set up the subproblems correctly that you set up the base cases correctly. How many ways are, can I reach step zero from step zero? Yeah, you're already there. There's only one way up to isomorphism. It's the same. So you could have declared it this way and then not had this a base case, just had this defined recursively. Right? Let's quickly talk about the runtime of an algorithm. I haven't even written the code for this, but usually uh, it's so obvious that you don't need to. You simply allocate, it's going to always follow the same pattern. Allocate the array, fill in the base cases, Loop over it and then just apply the recurrence. So the time that it, the, the DP algorithm always takes is usually going to be the, the size of the memory structure, and it's going to take that long to allocate it. So here we have a linear number of elements, so it's gonna, that's going to take linear time. Then we're going to loop over it and sum up some numbers. I claim that also will take linear time. Right? Yes? Yes, but notice that when we loop over it, dp of i minus 3 is computed first and stored. Suppose that's, d, suppose that's 7 and that's 10. You're going to store, you're going to compute 7, then you compute 8, then you compute 9, then you compute 10. So it's done bottom up from the smallest problems first to the biggest ones. Yes. That would be what? Yes. Correct. It's not the it's not the steps. I is the I DP of I is the number of ways to reach step I by allowing yourself to only jump one, two, or three times. But the value stored in DP of I is the number of ways. I is the step number. So dp of 10 will be equal to dp of 9 plus dp of 8 plus dp of 7. Because each of those three ways are the ways you could reach the 10th step, right? Notice we're not counting all the ways that you could skip over the 10th step or anything like this. But dp of 11 will count some of the ways that skips over the 10th step, right? Any questions on this example? This is sort of a warm up, sort of trivial.
Okay, here's the... Um, Uh, an operations game, suppose you could do two things. You can either add one or you can multiply by two. Those are the only two things you're allowed to do. Right. Um, uh, uh, how many operations, like the fewest number of operations to go from uh, 0 to k. Let me write out a few values of these. Um, how many ways can you go from 0 to 0? With how many, what's the fewest number of operations is 0? From 0 to 1, you can go by adding 1. From 0 to 2, you can add 1 and then multiply by 2, or you can add 1 and then add 1. Either way, it's the fewest number of operations is 2. 3 is 3. 4 is not 4, though. 4, you can add 1, multiply by 2, multiply by 2. So that's actually going to be 3. Um, 5 and 6 are going to be 4 and 4. 7 will be 5, but then 8 is going to be 4, and then 9 is going to be 5. So if you think of, if you notice immediately, first thing is it's not monotonic. It's not always increasing. Um, so we immediately run into sort of a problem, right? You might think about a greedy approach to this. That would be incorrect. Why? Suppose you did do a greedy approach. Um, Uh, like uh, multiplying by 2 will reach you really quickly to the lowest power of 2. But if your number is a power of 2 minus 1, you're out of operations. You can't multiply by 2 anymore, so you're forced to add 1. And you may have to add a lot of 1s. So a power of 2 minus 1 would be sort of a worst case scenario for that. Um, and also, if you multiply by 2, but then you stop, and then you simply add 1, and then you continue multiplying by 2, that single adding 1 will propagate greatly, because it'll be multiplied by 2, and then it'll be multiplied by 2 again, and multiplied by 2 again. So uh, it may be the case that you don't want to simply always multiply by 2 greedily and adding 1, because maybe the fewest number of operations to build some number k from 0 has to mix the two operations. Yes? Um, how about you start with 7? What are you going to do? You're going to subtract 1, because it's odd. Divide by 2, divide by 2, subtract 1, sub divide by 2, divide by 2. I claim that may not work. For, hard, for reasons that are hard to see. But although that, that seems actually, that, I kind of like that. That sounds easy, right? If it's odd, you simply subtract 1, and then otherwise you divide by 2. But the reverse obviously won't be true, right? Um, instead, we're going to use dynamic programming. So we're going to allocate uh, dp uh, from 0 to some k. And we're going to assign meaning to the kth element. So dp of i is equal min num ops to go 0 to k, excuse me, i, right? Um, now, what's our subproblems? Well, if you think if you're at some value and the number is odd, you could, what you, if you rewind the clock by one step, consider the last operation you did. Right? If i is odd, the last operation you did could not have been multiplying by 2. Um, but if i is even, then you probably multiplied by 2. So our occurrence is simply going to be dp of i is equal to uh, dp of i minus 1 if uh, i is odd. 
and dp of i over 2 if i is even. Do we see that? Do we see why that's true? If you're at some value, let's say 9, it's going to be, excuse me, plus 1. You have to add an operation there, obviously, right? So let's say you're at 9. The last operation you got from 9 could have only been 8, yes? Uh, because to go from, D, for example, let's suppose you're at 9, right? The last thing you did could have only been adding 1. So adding 1 itself is an operation. It's one of the two operations you're allowed to do. So we add 1 to the number. Right? Yes? Ah, uh, yeah. Yes, but it turns out that um, for this problem, if it's even, the structure of the problem is actually that you will always have multiplied by 2 for this problem. But the, that is, and when we implement it, that's what, actually what we're going to do. The operations that you could do if it's even, what case was there that you multiply, if you added one, you, so what he's saying is if you, are even, there is a scenario where the last two operations you did were adding two. Right? You add one and then you add one again. And that costs two operations. So you should take the min of dp of i minus one plus two and then dp of i over two plus one. But I, and that will end up implementing it. But I claim that it always, for, only for this problem, it'll always fall into the case that uh, doubling is faster for this one, only when it's even, right? Let's implement it. What are our base cases? What is dp of 0? Yeah. The number of ways you can get to 0 from 0 is 0. Number of operations. What about dp of 1? Yeah. Those are two base cases. Um, All right, I hope that's legible, right? The board has a weird texture again today, so things are going to get pretty blurry by the end, right? We're going to set dp of i simply to be dp of i minus 1 plus 1. But then we're going to take the, if i is even, we'll take the min of it with dp of i over 2 plus 1, right? And then, of course, last step, you don't want to forget, you have to choose the actual answer to return. You don't want to simply fill in the memory structure and then return nothing, so you return uh, the kth element of the array. Why? Because dp of i is defined to be the min number of operations to go from 0 to i. The last element of the array will be the number of operations to go from 0 to k, and that's the answer that you want. So it'll end up being dp of, uh, you'll return dp of k. Right. Uh, what's the runtime of the implementation? It takes linear time to allocate the array. Takes linear time to write to loop over it and do this recurrence. So linear time, compute a min. Um, yeah, usually it's trivial to analyze uh, the runtime of that. Yeah. 
No. The return is, it's not even in the, yeah, sorry, it's not in the, even in the for loop. Sorry. Ah, so you need to always fill in the base cases and you need to make sure you fill in the base cases so that it sets up the recurrence well and it also makes sense in the context of the problem. Sometimes the base cases aren't really defined in the problem. But dp of i should mean the number of steps to go from 0 to i. So dp of 0 should mean the number of steps to go from 0 to 0. There are 0 steps to go from 0 to 0. What's the fewest number of steps to go from 0 to 1? You have to only, you have to add one step. You can't do fewer than one step. So dp of 1 is 1 as well. So these two, you sort of have to realize by the definition of the problem, how am I going to define it? This is what they are. Then you loop over the other elements, defining those as the base cases, right? Yes? Uh, because I'm using Pythonic notation here, and you, it's not inclusive of the last element. That's the only reason. I want the kth value to be hit. So I simply will set it to k plus 1. Yeah, this is a me-specific thing. Should we in initialize what? That what sounds like it would take time, though. And I don't know how to analyze the runtime of that. If you all allocate each one to zero, you're going to fill in the answers. Another thing that's important for DP is that there's no, recur there's no recursion in the sense that something in the past is dependent upon things in the future. Right? If you think of uh, the memory structure like a graph, it's a DAG. Things only go forward in time. So things in the future are only calculated upon things in the past and not things in its future, you know? So the, anytime dp of i is going to be written to, it will only call things that have already been filled in. dp of i minus 1 will be hit, and dp of i over 2 will be hit before dp of i is hit. That's simply the way the loop works, right? That's essential for dp. <coughs> yeah? Uh, you don't, but this is uh, a standard way to write most DP problems, is that you will take the min of it with something. It'll take a min or a max, and it's usually defined this way. So I just wanted to put it into this more standard form. It's a pattern you'll see very often. Yeah. Yeah, you may assume that, and that's a question, that's like a computer question and not an algorithms question, but it is worth addressing. How long does it take to allocate memory? Um, we may suppose it takes linear time. It's an architecture specific, like practically an architecture specific problem though. Right, more questions on this? Excellent. Let's do the next problem. All right, this is a classic problem, house robber. You're given houses uh, of value uh, h1 uh, to hn. And you are a robber on the street. This is a street of houses, and you want to rob houses on this street. Um, but you cannot rob two consecutive houses, right? So, you wanna, so what is the maximum number of, that you can rob from houses h1 to hn? So you want to choose. Uh, a subset of the houses such that no two are consecutive and you maximize the amount that you take away, right? So here's an example. Um, if you have like a 2, 7, 9, 3, uh, and 1, the max you can rob would be uh, 2 plus 9 plus 1, right? You can't rob two consecutive houses. Um, so you have to make a decision, at some house, do you rob it or not? Because there may, robbing a house may mean you can't rob the next house, right? It's also not, a greedy algorithm also wouldn't work here. All 
right? Robbing house one with a value of 100 means you cannot rob two houses worth value 99. So a greedy algorithm also doesn't work. Um, but because the thing is built in a linear way, it's sort of begging for a DP problem. Do we understand the problem statement, first of all? You're, you're going to rob houses left to right, and you will choose to rob or not rob a house, and you want to maximize the amount that you rob total. You cannot rob two consecutive houses. Um, so DP, uh, uh, you're going to allocate DP uh, of uh, 1 to n, uh, where DP of i is equal to max can rob of h1 to hi, right? That's going to be our subproblem. First, you want to decide which way does, this, what does the subproblem go. We can fix it the leftmost and just consider the ith to be iterating this way. But sometimes it goes within it, you know, or, or something weird. What is dp of 1? h1. What's the, by the definition of the memory structure, dp of i is the max you can rob from h1 to hi. So dp of 1 is the max you can rob of h1. So you choose to rob the house, always. You may also suppose the houses are positively valued, and you're not going to rob a house and go into debt. That doesn't make sense. So uh, this is going to be h1, right? What about dp of 2? You are choosing the max you can rob of h1, h2. And by what that means is you can either choose to rob h1 or h2, but not both, right? It may help to write out a few elements and realize what the recurrence is. Let's just do one more. What is dp of 3? You can choose to rob h1, but then you can't rob h2, but then you can rob h3. Or you could rob h2. So actually, this is going to be the max of uh, h1 plus h3 or h2, right? And here, we maybe we write out a couple more. We kind of see the recurrence. Um, when you have a recurrence like this, you want to the problem says max. So what you're actually going to do is your dp of i is going to be the max of two options. What are your options? Everything in the world, everything ever, either is or isn't something. So you are either going to rob or not rob every house you've ever encountered. So you are going to, the two options are uh, rob house i or don't. You are always faced with those two choices. Um, and you simply are going, your DP recurrence is simply going to take the max of those two options. Those are the two worlds that exist for all the choices you can make. Uh, what is the value if you choose to rob house i? If you choose to rob house i, you will earn h of i plus the max you could rob from all the previous houses, right? But you can't rob, if you rob house h of i, you cannot rob house h of i minus 1, right? But you can rob a subset of houses from, zero, from h1 to h i minus 2. The max you can rob from h1 to h i minus 2 is going to be dp of i minus 2. Do we agree? This is the part where the answer is stored. DP of i minus 2 is what? The max you can rob from h1 to i minus 2. So instead of thinking about this as you know more maxes of sums of something, that's the answer that's going to be stored for you. DP of i minus 2 is the max you can rob from h1 to i minus 2. And maybe that means the max you can rob from h1 to i minus 2, maybe that doesn't rob house i minus 2 itself. You know? But that's OK. Because whatever that maximum is, is store, you've already computed and stored and written, down, written it down in the array. Whatever structure that problem has, it's already been computed for you. You've already computed it, right? Now, if you don't rob house i, what's the max you can steal? dp of i minus 1. 
You, you can, is the, it is the max you can rob from the, the previous i minus 1 houses. Now, you, want, you have these two possibilities. The question is worded as the maximum you can do. And at every choice, you're faced with the decision. So you're simply going to take the max of these. Right? The DP recurrence will always be some function of all your options. Every choice you have, every single choice. You either rob house i or you don't, and then you simply take the max of whatever those two values are. That's the solution to the house robber problem. I think this is a very important problem. I think it's uh, important that you see where the recurrence comes from. You make sure you understand it. Any questions on this one? Yeah? Uh, you don't want to, the way the problem is worded is you don't rob two consecutive houses simply so you don't set off an alarm. The problems are usually that DP apply have some weird contrived rule like this, which means you can't apply cool math and you have to apply um, DP. You know, sometimes there are closed math formulas for things, but then they add rules to the problem simply so you can't do them, you know? Uh, right. More questions? Yeah? Ah, you can skip two houses, yeah. And that, notice that the solution does capture that problem. So when you do DP, you should kind of try a little bit on paper. What about like uh, 100 to, to 100, right? You would skip those two houses, and you would rob the first and last house. Here's a, the reason that captures this. DP of i minus 2 does not assume that you rob house i minus 2. It is only the max you can rob from h1 to h i minus 2. And the max you can rob from those may not include robbing house h i minus 2. But whatever that maximum is, is stored and written down as a value in dp of i minus 2. So you may think, oh, uh, 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 someone worse may think, oh, I'm thinking, I'll simply take the max of the two alternating sequences. Because I want to rob as many houses as possible. But you can clearly come up with some counterexamples where that doesn't work. You know. Yes? The i minus 2 is what? This is the max you can rob. ADP stores what? The max you can rob of h1 to hi. So dp of i minus 2 stores the max you can rob of h1 to hi minus 2, the first i minus 2 houses, the max you can rob of them. It does not imply that you rob house hi minus 2, but it's simply the max you can rob of this neighborhood. Then if you add an additional house, what happens? If you choose to rob H, house hi, you'll earn everything from hi, plus anything you can rob from h1 to hi minus 2, but not including hi minus 1. You can, but whether or not you do so would be stored in the recurrence, right? dp of i minus 2 may or may not include, uh, whenever you compute this, it may or may not include i minus 2, right? And in fact, if you think about it, as you iterate over, if you store which value of the max you take at each point, that will correspond not only to the, the max you can steal, but which houses you actually steal from. Because th those are your two possibilities. You either rob house i or don't rob house i. And so which one you choose at each step is, is the actual answer as well, right? More questions on this problem? Do we understand the recurrence? You guys should have, uh, this is a, kind of problem you guys should be able to come up with a solution on your own, right? Questions? Good? All right, suppose you have an n by m grid, what is the number, if you can, but you can only, uh, uh, you can only go down and right. What is the number of paths from 1 comma 1 in the grid to uh, n comma m? 
So you could solve this problem actually with a little bit of combinatorics. There's probably a closed formula for the number of lattice paths. I don't remember it. Something choose something, n plus m something, right? But suppose you didn't know that, right? So you want the number of ways to go from here to here, right? Of an n by m grid. Uh, but you can only go down and right. So here's one path. Here's another path. Here's another path, right? Here's another path. Here's another path. Um, here's one more. One more. Let's just do that. Something. Okay. All right. We see there's quite a few paths to go from n m, is from one one to m m for n m, right? And you may know of a, if you're good, you may know of the combinatorial solution to this and just, you know, pull that from your memory. But the rest of us mortals have to come up with a, a DP algorithm for this problem. Uh, but it's not too hard to think of, uh, of the DP solution. First off, before we do that, do we understand what the problem is saying? We're, we're not trying to find the shortest path. It's a Manhattan distance problem, so all paths are the same length. We're trying to find the number of paths, right? Um, so simply what you're going to do, uh, if you notice, if you think about it, each path from nm, from 1, 1 to mm, is itself made up of smaller paths from 1, 1 to ij. So you're going to allocate uh, dp of 1n, uh, 1m, and you'll have uh, dp of ij is equal to the num paths from 1 comma 1 to i comma j. This is our first two-dimensional uh, problem, and you should be able to see why this begs for a two-dimensional problem, right? It's hard to decide when does your DP algorithm require a memory structure which is uh, two-dimensional or one-dimensional. But it feels like there's two degrees of freedom here, and you need to compute it in two dimensions, right? So the, uh, the structure will be two-dimensional. Then we're going to simply uh, return one element of this two-dimensional array. But it will compute for us all the subproblems uh, for every i, j less than n, m, right? Any questions on the memory structure so far? We understand this part? Fairly obvious once you get the hang of it. Um, let's just jump right in. What's the recurrence? So. Now, if you're at some square where you can only go down and right. So if you're at a square, you could have only, the number of paths that reach a certain square could only have come from uh, above, right? How many ways can you reach this square? You can only reach this square from two previous operations. You can only move down, which means you came from above. And you can only move right, which means you came from the left. Do we agree? So the number of ways to reach ij is equal to the number of ways you can reach these two cells, which are i minus 1j and then ij minus 1. Let's take a second to digest this. Yeah. It's an m by n. n by m, excuse me. Not that it particularly matters. This sh I don't want to erase, oh, because the board is kind of weird. But it should say n to m. Thank you. Right. Um, what did we do again here? We simply rewinded the clock one step and considered what the last thing we did was. That's going to be the recurrence. So you're going to simply look at, well, all the ways you can reach ij, you can only come from above and to the left. 
So you simply sum those two elements of your memory structure. Um, let's implement this. Uh, DP, uh, we'll say def count paths. Um, in a 2D problem, the base cases are always not easy. But what are the base cases here? Yes. So you don't actually have a constant number of base cases. You actually have a linear number of base cases. The entire top row here is going to be the base cases, and this entire left column is going to be the base cases. What are the base cases of those values? Those are going to be um, for i in one n dp of i comma one is going to be one for i for j in one m dp of one j is equal to one. Right. If you're at a position on the border, the only number of ways to reach there is only moving left, 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 left. So there's exactly one path if you're on the border. Yes? Oh, same question? OK. Yeah, it's one. The number of ways to reach here, for example, is one. You can only go left. So if you're on the border, there's one way. If you're one below the border, there's only two ways. This way, or this way, or I guess this way, the number of ways you could take a down move, right? If you're at like 2 comma m or something, you can do exactly one down move, but you could do it anywhere, right? So that, will, that corresponds perfectly to the way our summation works. So that's, a, that's all it is. It sounds like a hard problem, but then when you implement it in DP, it seems almost trivial. Uh, same pattern. <coughs> same pattern for everything. Allocate the array, fill in the base cases, loop over it, uh, just put the recurrence in the for loop, and then return one element. That's almost always the pattern that a DP algorithm has. Coming up with the solution is so much easier than implementing it. We won't, sometimes we may not even ask that you implement it. Right? It's, it's almost ridiculously trivial. Um, but still, all these decisions need to be made. You need to decide what the base cases are. You need to decide how the recurrence works. How is the problem a function of its subproblems here? Again, it's, notice that we're counting the number of paths. We're not taking a max or a min or something. And if we're counting the number of paths, we're usually going to sum the two, the two, all the possible values. right? So the, the, it is a sum. Then you decide on what you're going to return. Here you're going to return one uh, element of the uh, array. Any questions on counting the number of paths? We'll just do a variant of this problem in a second. All right. Uh, consider a variant of counting paths, but with bombs. Uh, and basically, what this means is there is another, uh, you have an n by m grid, but then occasionally there's just bombs in the road for some reason. Uh, something like this, like a minesweeper style something, I don't know, right? Um, and you're given the location of the bombs through an additional array. And, oh, yes. And you want to count the number of paths that go down and right but avoid bombs. So for example, this would be a valid path. 
Um, this would be a valid path. Maybe this is a valid path. Uh, this would not be a valid path, right? That would not be a valid path, and so on. So we're asking for the number of paths from 1, 1 to mn, right? But the paths that avoid the bombs. So the recurrence is going to be almost the same, but it's going to be slightly modified. So let's just skip ahead a little bit. Let's just call dp of ij is going to be the number of paths to ij. What is this going to be a recurrence? What are you saying the recurrence is? Mm, how many paths go through a certain cell? Many, many paths can go through a certain cell. Let's say you're, you could go, you, let's say you count all the paths that go to here. That includes some of the paths that intersect bombs. But it includes the, the paths that go through the bombs may go to the bomb through multiple ways and then go out of the bomb cell through multiple ways. So think of maybe just one recurrent, instead of taking two problems and then trying to uh, combine them together, think of how you can just make one strong recurrence for this problem, right? Uh, let's hear, does anyone have a conjecture of what the recurrence should be? Yes? Yeah, that's, that's basically it. It's going to be like a dp of i minus 1 j plus a dp of i j minus 1 if bomb of i comma j false. And this is going to be 0 if true. If bomb i comma j true. Can you read that? Basically, like, think about how uh, the paths work if you have a bomb above, right? If you have a bomb above and you want to reach this square, what's the number of ways you can reach this square? You can't actually come from above. You could, the only way to reach this square ends up being from the left. So it's going to be the number of ways you could come from the left. So what you do is you simply set that, but the number of ways to reach the bomb, we will set to 0. So it's going to be 0 plus this. And you could break this up into cases if you wanted to. The cases are something like this. Here's a bomb. Uh, something like this, right? If you have something like this, the number of ways to reach this square is going to be 0. If you have something like this, the number of ways to reach this square is going to be this one. If you have something like this, the number of ways to reach this square is going to be this one, right? But this recurrence captures that identically. Do we agree? Uh, simply by say, setting the bomb locations to be 0, and you would also have to modify the base case, of course, to check if there's any bombs on the edge. But you would simply set the locations of the bombs in the DP array to be 0. And then you compute the summations normally, right? So anything that's not a bomb would account for the number of ways to reach the bomb square to be 0. And then those would be recurrenced correctly uh, so that the number of paths that go through it skip all bombs. Because the number of ways to reach a square with a bomb was set to 0. You can't reach a square with a bomb, so to speak. Right? Do we understand this recurrence? You could have broken this up into several cases and tried to solve it that way. But the recurrence em emulates those cases correctly. So convince yourself that of all the possible options, this recurrence still correctly works. Any more questions on uh, DP in general? It's just sort of a, a warm up lecture, yeah? So 
So Bellman Ford is kind of like, so why does Dijkstra's work? Dijkstra's works because you have a min, you, take, you pop the min of the priority queue. And everything else in the path, ha everything else that's not the minimum of the priority queue has a longer path. So there is no shorter path through all these other vertices to the current min element of the priority queue. So you're allowed to pop it off and fix its solution of the shortest path. However, you can think of Bellman Ford as simply Dijkstra's, but a priority queue is not a priority queue anymore because you don't have that property with negative edge weights. You simply convert the priority queue into an array. And then you do perform the same updating the minimums, but you don't get to pop things out of the priority queue anymore. Why? Because uh, think of a, a graph with a negative edge weight as a, as a sort of power up. And then maybe you will take positive value edges to go out of your way to reach this one. Um, Dijkstra's works because you can sort of find the minimum updating in a specific direction. You sort of know where you're coming from. But that's not true for Bellman Ford because the minimum may take the long way around. Something like this. So you need to simply perform the Dijkstra style update. And Dijkstra has a recurrence, DP recurrence. Bellman Ford simply applies the DP recurrence v minus 1 times to all vertices. Right? That's sort of the, the spirit of Dijkstra's. Floyd Warshall also DP algorithm. Right? It's sort of you take the min of the two possible options, which is either that you go through a certain vertice k or you don't go through a certain vertice k. Same, same idea uh, in Floyd Warshall. Right. More questions on DP? Yeah? So, like, this is not the way I would have implemented it at first, but this is the way that most DP algorithms will look that you will have a loop, and then you'll just have a min of something, or a max of something, rather than cases. So I just wanted to put it in a more standard looking form. It's not the most obvious way to implement this, though, given the way we define the recurrence. Well, notice that if dp of i minus 2 plus 1 is less than dp of i minus 1 plus 1, the min will take its course. The min will work. But if it's not, then, the min, then it stays. The plus 1 stays. We're taking the min of the two options if it's even. OK. More questions on DP in general? All right, I'll be around after class if you have any questions.